Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to worship this morning. I'm glad that you braved the uh, cold, uh, snowy weather out. I think this week we're due for a couple more winter snowstorms before old man winter uh, leaves us for good and spring arrives. Uh, we do uh, welcome also all of you that are worshiping with us on Facebook Live or on other social media. Thank you for joining us as well this morning. We begin our worship uh, with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. And so we'll confess our sins before God and before one another. O oh God of light, you light a fire within us and ask us to shine, but we are quick to hide and make it. We shrink, shrink from challenges, avoid responsibility, and, and deny the goodness of your creation. We seek all the praise and then don't believe it. Forgive us for our pain, self-absorbed. Children of God, never fear, for you have always lived in the mercy of your Creator. Hear the words of absolution and believe them. You are forgiven. You are made whole. You are restored to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Our gathering opening hymn this morning is all glory, law, and honor. Jesus, 
Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met them. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed into the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. But they did not understand this saying. Its meaning was concealed from them, so that they could not receive it. And they were afraid to ask him about the saying. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Praise to you, or um, grace to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Have you ever taken a long drive across the country on vacation? It's fun for a couple of hours, but pretty soon the monotony of the road kicks in, and at least when I'm driving, I kind of wish I was already there. About that time, I start watching for the signs and the billboards along the way. They help me to stay focused and they give me a foretaste of what's coming ahead. I'll never forget our family drive across the country when we moved from San Antonio, Texas, all the way up to Anchorage, Alaska. It was a long trip, and along the way, we kept seeing these signs for the Wall Drugstore. I don't know if you can see it there, but they are very, very proud of their free ice water. They advertise that thing hundreds and hundreds of miles away and on multiple billboards as you get closer to uh, Wall Drug in South Dakota. And then there was a trip there where, where we were heading south uh, down the East Coast, and we started seeing all these famous signs from Pedro, south of the border. There's one, Shalom, they said. And that one, I think, was um, eight miles away, but those things start about 100 or so miles out, too, and you get them about every mile or so as you go, and it helps to keep your interest, and by the time you got there, you couldn't help but stop at papers. Um, on the surface, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus is sort of like one of those billboards. It reveals to us what's ahead, what's coming. Peter, James, and John, and then by extension, all of us, we're given this billboard of Jesus in all of his glory. From the time that Jesus came down from that mountaintop experience, he knew exactly where he was headed and what lay ahead for him. Luke tells us a little bit further on in the story that um, when Jesus came down from that mountain, he set his face toward Jerusalem. I said on the surface, the story is sort of like a billboard pointing Jesus and all of his followers ever since toward Jerusalem. But the event that took place there, when you take a closer look at the events on that mountaintop, reveals so much more about Jesus and where he fits into God's plan for creation. At this point in the journey of Jesus' ministry, He'd already chosen his disciples. He'd already formed his inner circle of Peter, James, and John. 
And all of his disciples had been sent out into the towns and villages, healing the sick and preaching the good news that God's kingdom has come near. And then about eight days before this transfiguration experience, Jesus revealed to them his plan to go to Jerusalem, where he would be betrayed and beaten and crucified, and on the third day would be raised from the dead. At that point, Peter, who had just exclaimed, you are God's only son, the Messiah, turned around and rebuked Jesus and said, God forbid such a thing would ever happen to you. I won't allow it. To which Jesus famously replied, get behind me, Satan. You have your mind set on human things, not on God's plan. So as we pick up the story today, it's been eight days of awkward silence. Luke records no other stories, no dialogue, no healings, no preaching, no teaching. And I believe that's why Peter was taken up on that mountain to witness this theophany. That's what they call it in seminary when God reveals himself to people, a theophany. I admit I've got no idea why James and John were chosen to go, but there they are up on the mountain. Maybe they sided with Peter in rejecting Jesus' notion of heading to Jerusalem to be crucified. But no matter why they were there, it seems pretty clear why God wanted Peter, James, and John to know, and through them also for us to understand, well, something, something about Jesus in all of this. Through their sleepy eyes, Peter, and James, and John, they see Jesus all glowing white. Um, the translation really, it, you know, we say its clothes were bright, but in the uh, in the Greek, it, it has more of a meaning that his clothes were like a flash of lightning. And then Jesus isn't alone. He's talking with Moses and Elijah. Now, at this point, I have to stop and ask, what about these two characters from the Old Testament is so significant? as to be brought down to earth from heaven so that Peter and James and John and us would witness this theophany of Jesus. Some ordinary people become so famous that they actually become larger than life. They become icons in their profession. Their image becomes the face of the thing that they represent. Here, here's what I mean. Take, take Albert Einstein, for example. You recognize who that is immediately. And you start thinking about science, or a genius, or mathematics, or maybe just a bad hair day, I don't know. Um, or, or take LeBron James. Immediately you recognize him as the face of the NBA. Now maybe 30 or 40 years ago, or however long it was, maybe Michael Jordan would have been the face. But now it's, it's this guy. And it's the same for Moses. And for Elijah, Moses was the face of the law. He was the one who first met God in the burning bush, but then, through God, led the people out of bondage in Egypt, into the wilderness, up on the mountain where God gave him the 15 commandments, which he then dropped one, according to um, the, the life of Brian and Monty Python, and then it, really ended up with only 10. So you got 10 now. And then there's Elijah. He was the face of the prophets. Every time you see Elijah, usually you see him with a, uh, a scroll because prophets, they didn't foretell the future. We think a prophet is somebody who foretells the future, but a prophet is just somebody who speaks for God. This is my statue I have of Elijah. You notice he's carrying a big sword. That's because Elijah was the one who slew all the prophets of Baal, the, the false god in the Old Testament. So Elijah, the face of the prophets. These two were larger than life figures. And there they are on this mountaintop conspiring with Jesus regarding the plan for Jesus' departure. 
The word that we have translated as departure in the Greek is the word exodus. I don't think it was by accident that Luke used that specific Greek word. He wants us to remember how Moses led those Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt through the wilderness into the freedom of the promised land. At the same time, the iconic figure of Elijah is meant to remind us of all the many times the prophets were sent by God, not to reveal the future, but to be the mouthpiece of God, calling God's people to repent from worshiping false gods like Baal. And so picture the scene. Here's the two biggest icons of the Jewish faith, Moses representing the law, and Elijah representing God's continuing voice in the world. And they're having this high-level meeting with Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who is about to become the face of the gospel, the face of the good news for mankind. All three, they're out there reviewing and discussing the plan to begin the trip to Jerusalem, where Jesus will lead all of God's people from our bondage to sin and death into the freedom of living in God's kingdom here on earth. Another thing I learned from this transfiguration story is that even when you don't like what Jesus is saying or where he's heading, where he's leading you, God, the almighty creator of the universe, wants us to listen to him. Now, this isn't your mom or your dad or a school teacher or even your pastor telling you to listen to Jesus. This command comes from the big guy himself. It can't come from any higher source. This order comes all the way from the top. Peter and maybe James and John, they didn't like the choices that, and the decisions that Jesus was about to make. And Peter said so directly to him. And so here God, he doesn't use an intermediary like a prophet or, a, or um, Elijah to speak, but comes down in the form of a cloud and tells us plainly and directly, this is my son, listen to him. Okay, so, I get it. What exactly are we supposed to do? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do while he was alive that was so earth shattering? Well, I can't tell you everything that Jesus said or did in the short sermon. You all have Bibles, I'm sure. If you don't have them with you, I'm sure you have them at home. Take them out, dust them off. Uh, some of the Bibles are even made really easy for you to figure out what Jesus said because the words Jesus speaks are all in red. Read it. If you don't have time, here's a short synopsis. Jesus came to inaugurate and to bring into being the kingdom of God here on earth. His life and his ministry taught and showed us what that means. In God's kingdom, being angry and calling someone a fool is equivalent to murder. That's what Jesus said. In God's kingdom, people take care of people. That's what Jesus did. There will be no more of these people stepping over poor, wretched Lazarus on the street. In the kingdom of God, evil is repaid with good and weapons. They're turned into garden tools. It's pretty simple stuff, but oh so hard to do. Sometimes I wonder if Christians today even long for the kingdom of God to reign in the here and the now. We get so preoccupied about, well, the kingdom of God is heaven, and we're going to go there when we die. What about now? What about here? I mean, we love to claim America is this great Christian nation, but we're the first ones that want to retaliate when an enemy strikes us or our national interests. Aren't Christians supposed to turn the other cheek? I know national security is complicated, and we do have the right to defend ourselves. This just shows you how huge and terrifying the real enemy is. The real enemy isn't the Iranians or the Chinese or the terrorists. 
the evil enemy is the power of evil that exists in our world. We don't want to die. Jesus said, take up the cross and follow us. We don't want to. We don't want to die. I'm sure Jesus didn't want to die either. And I'll bet Peter didn't wish to be crucified upside down on a hill, what they call the Vatican. Nor did James want to be beheaded. Nor did John want to spend his last days exiled on a small island in Patmos because he proclaimed Jesus Christ to be the Lord. And yet, Jesus called them and us to pick up our own crosses and follow them. This transfiguration story was thought to be so important, so profound by the early church that they included it in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's meant for us and for all people who ever heard or read the story over the millennia as both a sign and a pointing to the glory of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, who is God's one and only Son. It's also meant to be an encouragement, though, to those who take up the cross and do follow Jesus. Yes, indeed, this is God's plan. And Jesus is the one we are to listen to and the one that we are to follow. For some skeptics, we, we need to hear that message from God himself. And for all of us, we need to know that when following Jesus hurts, it might even get us killed, that mountain where all of life's dirtiness lives and thrives, that's what we're called. We're called into that. Or not on the we're called from the mountain into that dirtiness. Down into the valley of disease and sin and death, where, where the devil still rules the day. <clears throat> Maybe we're not going to be glow in the dark disciples like Jesus turned into up on that mountain. But when we follow the Lord Jesus, we are transformed. We're transformed into what Luther called little Christs for our neighbors. We go after our lives, after those mountaintop experiences, uh, into the ministries, uh, and we're encouraged and we're reminded to keep on trying our best, walking in the kingdom of God as Jesus did. Maybe we need that reminder that Jesus' disciples also needed. That Jesus is indeed the way and the truth and the life. And only with Jesus can we hope to see God's kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. And so, may your lives have many highs on the mountaintops that help you get through those lows and valleys. And may we all pay more attention to the signposts and the billboards that God places along the way in our journey of life to help to remind us the kingdom of God comes to earth in the way that we live, the way we act, the way we treat one another. May you gladly take up that cross. And as we enter into now the season of Lent this coming week, may we all follow Jesus and set our faces as he did toward Jerusalem. And most of all, may your life reflect all the glory and the honor to our Father and to our Savior, Jesus, as well as to the Holy Spirit, who calls and gathers us and then equips us for this journey that we have. Amen. And now we're going to be treated with some uh, special music by our dear sister in Christ, Catherine. Is going to be singing. Um, I told you the name of the song, and I forgot. It's, it's called Come Alive. It's a Lauren Daigle Thank you. tune based on Ezekiel 37. All those dry bones down in the valley.
Through the eyes of men it seems there's so much we have lost As we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked One by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves But we know that you are God, yours is the victory. We know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we'll step into that valley unafraid. Yeah, yeah. As we come. By your spirit, breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save, you alone can save.
you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, who is worshipped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray for the church and for the world and for all those who are in need. How often your people lose sight of your truth, O Lord. Forgive our short-sightedness and ignorance when you have clearly shown us how to live as your faithful children. Gracious God, your love extends to the heavens. Ours is but a pale imitation of what you have shown to us. Bless our efforts to embody your love toward others and toward you. Gracious God, the mysteries of this world can sometimes baffle us, Lord, and fold us with awe at your power and grace, and embolden us to proclaim your gospel to all. Gracious God, sometimes we must let go in order to heal fully. Release us from past fixations, grievances, and regrets and equip us to take on a new future. Heal those who cry out to you, especially Skip Blankenhorn. Congratulations to Nick, Becky, and Russell Daniels, and grandparents Marge and Dave Warren for Marie Elmore. Patty Cannon, Junior Coos, Melinda, and the whole world as we work with your power to get through this pandemic that has so encased us over the past year. Gracious God, we celebrate the lives of Jody Hessler, Nate and Ivy Cheeseman, along with St. Paul and all your faithful missionaries and proclaimers of your good news. Inspire us to do likewise and dedicate our lives to serving you, gracious God. Amen. Receive our prayers and shed light on our path as we seek to walk in your ways and bring glory to you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Instead of passing our offering plate, we ask you to please place your offering in the offering plate conveniently located in the rear of the worship space. For those who are worshiping outside in our parking lot, we also have an offering receptacle out there. And for those who are worshiping with us on social media, um, if you go to our website at pittsburghtlc.org, um, you'll find a, uh, a button where you can make an electronic donation. And so let us now pray for our offerings that we'll receive this day. We offer all we have to you, O God, our lives and our possessions. For all that we have, you have given to us. Receive the gifts that we bring and find favor in our efforts to serve you through serving others. For the sake of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Jesus is the tie that binds us together, and so let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, that we have a good government and that we have uh, people that 
uh, are in government that uh, are looking out for our best interests. We hope and we pray. Um, but coming up then on Wednesday this week, it's Ash Wednesday, and it's the beginning of Lent. And so uh, we will have an in-person uh, worship service here at the church, uh, which will include the imposition of ashes onto the forehead like we normally would do, even without the pandemic. However, it will be done with Q-tips, and I'll be all gloved up and masked, and everyone will have a, their own brand new Q-tip that no one else has never touched another forehead. Um, and so it will be safe to do, or at least as safe as I could possibly think to make it. Now, the only thing that could change that is we have two winter storms that are bearing down on us uh, Monday and then again on Wednesday. So um, keep, keep your ear tuned to the uh, one call. Uh, we'll put out a one call if we have to cancel. Uh, but we're planning on that unless the weather uh, changes things. And then also on Thursday, we have the finance meeting and the uh, church council meeting um, that we moved from Wednesday to Thursday because of the Ash Wednesday. So same thing goes with that. But if you're on the council, uh, pay attention to the one call so that you know whether or not you have to cancel those or not. Um, then, uh, starting a week from Wednesday, all the Wednesdays in Lent, you know, we used to have a uh, worship service on Wednesday evening with the soup supper and all that um, seemed to sort of wane in interest. But this year, I, I thought, I'm going to um, try something a little different. I found this Artisans of the Crucifixion, it's called. Uh, and it's got a different uh, sort of a, a, a one-person monologue, kind of a one-act play or one-person play. Um, and it's uh, looking at the um, events surrounding Jesus' passion and his trial and his crucifixion from the eyes of some artisans, like a tanner who maybe made the whip that the soldiers used to, uh, to, to flog Jesus, or the basket uh, weaver that um, made the crown of thorns for Jesus, or the stone, uh, the, the blacksmith that pounded out the nails. So it, it's a different perspective. It'll be from the eyes of a different uh, person every, uh, every Wednesday. Uh, we'll pre-record those, and we'll set them to premiere uh, about 7 o'clock Wednesday evening, and then you can start watching it then, or you can watch it anytime afterwards. Um, so that'll be a weekly event. Um, and I'm also, um, I'm willing to do all of the parts in here. I have one person who's already, my wife, my lovely wife, has volunteered to do the basket, the person who makes the baskets. Um, but I still would like to have somebody who could, who could play the part of a blacksmith or a carpenter or a stonemason. So if you're interested in um, performing and, and being videotaped on one of these, uh, why please give me a call or, or an email or talk to me today if you're here. That's about the only announcements I have. Are there any other announcements for the good of our order today? Yes, Peggy? Um, I got a thank you card from Gateway in Greenville. And I don't know if any of you know, there was a family of five that had that we fought for that had lost their father during the year. And the oldest boy needed a bed, so we got that. And then uh, more recently, uh, Kevin and I talked, and I think he talked to other people, but it was okay. But we paid their electric bill in January, and now we've paid their electric bill in February, just to give them a little boost and help them out. So they were very thankful, and Gateway thanked us profusely. So. Thank you, Peggy. That's just the, the way Trinity is. You know, that's, that's what it means to be in the kingdom of God. So thanks. Thanks for that. Always encouraging. Are there any other announcements? If not, then um, our worship service will continue with our sending blessing. Please rise if you're able. God the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Our sending Him is this little light of mine.
Facebook and other social media. Until next week when we gather, until Wednesday, hopefully, when we gather again, depart in Christ's love. Seeking, welcoming, serving.